Now we're going to hear from Dana Goodlow, who is the Supervising Genetic Counselor for the University of Alabama at Birmingham. She began at UAB in 2011 as a genetic counseling intern and completed her genetics training with the UAB Genetic Counseling Training Program in 2013. She has served as a genetic counselor for the UAB Muscular Dystrophy Association Multidisciplinary Care Center since 2015. And in addition to neuromuscular disease, Dana primarily sees patients in pediatric general genetics and cleft and craniofacial clinic. So Dana, thank you for being here. You can go ahead and present your slides. Thanks guys. Um, let me get this open. All right, can everybody see my slides okay? Yes, perfect. All right, so um, thank you, uh, Nicole. I'm really excited to be with you guys this morning. Um, I've got a pretty big task to talk about genetics and um, neuromuscular disease and kind of the testing process. Um, so I wanted to start by just kind of going over some basic genetics concepts and modes of inheritance. I think that'll really help to lay the foundation to talk more about testing and how that's going to apply to a patient with neuromuscular disease and help them. Um, so just kind of starting off with the basics, um, our genes are compacted into our chromosomes, which hold all of our genetic information. We have 23 pairs of chromosomes, so we get one copy of each pair from our mom and one copy from our dad to give us a total of 46 chromosomes. Um, this is just kind of a picture of what they all look like when we're looking at them under a microscope. Um, they don't always line up quite that straight and nice for us. It's a little bit adapted um, with the computer, but you can kind of see what we're looking at. And if we zoom in really closely on those chromosomes, we start to see those individual genes that are within that chromosome. So our genetic material is made up of four different nucleotides, A, C, T, and G. And these are in a certain order that give us a kind of a blueprint or instruction manual for how our bodies need to grow and develop. And every gene then encodes for a protein. And those proteins all have individual and specific jobs within our bodies. We have thousands and thousands of genes. Um, we actually don't know the exact number, but it's estimated to be about 20,000 genes. For the majority of those, we don't know exactly what their function is, um, just because there's so much to learn there and really unfold. And so um, what we do know is that changes in these genes can certainly affect the way our bodies grow and develop. Um, I want to go into a little bit about the inheritance patterns. Um, so this is how genes are passed down in families and how conditions are passed down in families. So one of the first ones I want to talk about is autosomal dominant inheritance. So I mentioned that we have two copies of every chromosome. So for every gene on that chromosome, we also have two copies. Again, one is coming from mom and one is coming from dad. In an autosomal dominant condition, only one of those two copies has to have what we call a harmful difference or a pathogenic variant where that's actually changing the way that that gene functions. And so in this example, you can see that the father is affected with a genetic condition and the mother is not. So mom is always gonna be passing on working copies of that gene. Whereas dad has a 50% chance to pass on his working copy and a 50% chance to pass on that non-working copy or the copy that has that genetic mutation. So half of their children will be affected with the condition and half of their children will not. This does not discriminate based on gender, so males and females would be equally affected, um, and that is different in some other inheritance patterns, so it's good to know that this one is you know, not a gender bias. With recessive conditions, we have mom and dad being unaffected with the condition, but they are both considered a carrier. So for these conditions, we need both copies of the gene to not be working properly. So mom and dad each have one working copy and one non-working copy, and each of them would have a 50% chance to pass on each of those. And so when we combine that risk together, it gives us a 25% chance to have a child that's affected with the condition. 
we would then have a 50% chance to have a child that's a carrier and a 25% chance to have a child that's not affected and not a carrier. So those carriers then when they go on to have their own children could have a child that's affected um, themselves even though they did not have the condition. Again, not a gender bias here, males and females equally at risk to be affected. This um, inheritance pattern is where we do start getting into that gender bias. So X-linked inheritance is a condition where the mother is a carrier for the condition. So these are conditions that are present only on the X chromosome. So if we think back to our chromosomes that we were looking at earlier, in those 23 pairs, the first 22 are the same in men and women, and the last pair is our sex chromosomes, and that's what helps determine our gender. So males have one X and one Y, and females have two Xs. So for a female, if one of those Xs has that genetic change, she does not present with signs and symptoms of the condition because she has that backup copy. However, if a male has an X that is affected with that genetic difference, he only has that one copy of X because his other sex chromosome is a Y. And so he will present with signs and symptoms of the condition and have the disorder. So we look at this kind of based on gender, we would say 50% of males would not have the condition and 50% of males would have the condition. And then 50% of females would not be a carrier and 50% of females would be a carrier. This is a good um, example when we're thinking about Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So our moms are typically carriers and then have affected male sons. Duchenne is a bit of an exception to the rule of mom does not have features of the condition because our carrier females for Duchenne can show signs and symptoms of the condition. And that's because in a female, in every cell in her body, one X is turned on and one X is turned off because we really don't need both of those. So we're looking at about a 50% chance that there would be that non-working copy that would be active in a cell. And that can be skewed, so it's not always an even distribution. So we may see more cells with that genetic variant that are, are turned on or more cells without that genetic variant that are turned on. So if more of those cells with that genetic change are turned on, then we're going to see more signs and symptoms. However, they typically do not present the same way as a male. They don't have a lot of the same features. They're typically much more mildly affected. Um, those are kind of the basic inheritance patterns. We do see a few others, um, but they're much more rare. So I want to go into the types of genetic changes now. Um, so I mentioned earlier that our chromosomes are kind of like an instruction manual telling us how to grow and develop. So if we think of our genetic material or our chromosomes as a book and our genes are like the sentences in a chapter in that book, mutations would be spelling changes or changes in those individual sentences within that book. Um, there's several different types of changes that we can see. Um, the most common is a missense, which just means we're substituting one letter, one word, um, getting a change there. Um, it doesn't totally um, affect the overall structure, um, but can make it read a little bit different. Um, so rather than saying, you know, the car was red, it's now going to say, the car was hat or the car was rad. So you're still getting a little bit of the main idea, but not the full complete picture that we would like to see. Insertions would be we're adding a word or a letter. So we've put a whole new piece of genetic material in there. So instead of the car was red, now we're saying the car was red red or the car was e red. So adding a little bit of an extra um, bit of information. Nonsense mutations um, stop the instructions kind of right where that occurs. Um, these tend to be more harmful than those missense or insertions because they're completely cutting it off before it can even really start. And so this, instead of saying the car was red, we're just saying the car. So it's kind of halting that right in the middle. And then deletions would kind of be the opposite of insertions where we're taking something out. So 
can really change that meaning. So instead of the car was red, the was red. Well, that doesn't really make as much sense. Um, so it's hard to get a full picture of what you were trying to say. So these are kind of examples of how those genes are getting changed where they're no longer making sense the way we wanted them to. And they have different impacts on the way that we read that gene. Um, this is just kind of showing you a little bit more in detail of those changes um, using actual genetic code. So you can see here, we're changing that genetic letter and swapping that G out for a T, which is gonna to totally change um, the specific amino acid that's put into that protein. And then with those nonsense variants, stopping that structure altogether so it's not able to continue to read through. And those frame shift where we're getting a totally new series of letters and will probably lead us to a stop codon somewhere down the line. So we're still getting a little bit of material made, maybe a little bit farther than where that abnormality is, but still ending up with a shortened um, protein at the end. Trinucleotide repeat disorders are a bit of a um, kind of unique brand of genetic um, abnormality. Uh, within several genes, we have a series of nucleotides that are repeated a certain number of times, and that's normal to have those. Um, so examples within the neuromuscular community would be things like hereditary ALS or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Friedrich's ataxia. These are pretty rare though, so they're not ones that people often hear about. With these conditions, rather than having the appropriate number of repeat expansions, it starts to get even larger. So for these conditions, they become unstable when they get past a certain point, and it changes the overall function of the gene. So it may silence that gene, and we're not getting that protein made at all, or giving us an abnormal protein, but it can really change the effect of that. These are conditions where we see something called anticipation, where one generation may have a certain number of repeats and that number expands and gets larger when passed on to their children. I mentioned that instability and that's where we see that is when we pass that on. A good example in the neuromuscular community for this would be myotonic dystrophy. So oftentimes children with congenital myotonic dystrophy may have a parent with a classic myotonic dystrophy. So that parent may have 250, 300 repeats. They have mild muscle symptoms, things like cataracts, diabetes, more subtle features of the disorder. And then when they pass that on to their child, particularly when a female passes that on, for whatever reason, it's more unstable in females, that number goes from that 250 to 300 to greater than 1,000. And now their child has much more severe muscle disease. We're seeing low muscle tone right at birth in that newborn period, just a very different view of the condition than what we saw in their parent. Um, so that's important to know when you're thinking about reproduction, when you have a neuromuscular condition, is that your child may not have the same features that you have. It could be a different presentation and could be more severe in some cases, like these repeat expansion disorders. So that kind of covers some of the basics about what types of changes we could see on the testing. So I want to dig into the testing a little bit. Um, when you're getting a genetic test, it's important to make sure that you're testing for the right thing. So getting a good description of your diagnosis as far as your features and symptoms of the disorder so that we can make sure we're testing the right condition. And then when you get those results back, really understanding what those results mean. Uh, typically, when we think about genetic testing, we're thinking about three types of genetic testing results. So the first would be a positive result. This means that we found a known harmful difference or pathogenic variant within that gene that's changing the way that that gene functions. So this is confirming our molecular diagnosis. So while we may see a young man that we think has Duchenne muscular dystrophy, until we get that genetic test that says 
yes, we see a change in the DMD gene. We can't say with 100% certainty that that is true. But once we get that molecular result, we can say, yes, he definitely has Duchenne. It's really important to get these results because they can influence our medical management. Um, there's lots of drug treatment options that are coming up. Um, we've been working for many years on getting these gene therapies and different medications that can treat neuromuscular disease. And some of those are very specific to the type of genetic result that you have. It's not just your diagnosis. It's not just your specific gene that's impacted, but the actual change within the gene. So Duchenne is a great example of this. Um, within the Duchenne gene, there are various differences that are more amenable to certain treatments. And so knowing your specific genetic result can influence if you're you know, eligible to get those treatments or not, and if those would be helpful for you. The next type of result I want to talk about is actually on the other end of the spectrum, and that's a negative result. So this means that we did not see any harmful differences found in that gene. An important thing to note is that this does not mean with certainty that you do not have that diagnosis. Genetic testing is very good, but it is not perfect. For certain conditions, it has a much higher detection rate than in others. And so when we're seeing a negative result, if we're looking at you know, some conditions, that may be very certain that they do not have that diagnosis. Whereas in other conditions, having a negative result doesn't always mean that we've completely eliminated that possibility for that diagnosis. So it's good to talk with your providers and see what is the chance that I still have this diagnosis or do we need to be looking into other diagnoses that I could have and could consider other testing. Um, it may be that we need to look into testing another family member. So if we're testing somebody that maybe doesn't have all of the features of the condition, but we feel like maybe they could have it and we get a negative result, are they negative because they truly are negative and don't have the condition in the family? Or are they one of those individuals that falls into that category where we just weren't able to find the explanation there? Um, these are actually some of the hardest results to interpret, in my opinion. Negative results can be very difficult and very challenging because it doesn't tell us a whole lot. It doesn't say what you have, but it also doesn't say what you don't have necessarily. Um, and sometimes finding out what you do have, you do have to go through the process of what do you not have. So it can be important to get those ruled out. Um, but negative results don't mean that you don't have that or you don't have a muscle disease. Obviously, there was a reason that led you to getting testing in the first place, and so it's important to kind of talk with your providers about what that result means. And then kind of going over to this middle result, and I'm going to spend a little more time on this. Um, this is our variant of uncertain significance or unknown significance. And what that means is that there is a change in that gene. However, we're not certain that that's harmful or not. We all have differences in our genes. That's what helps make us unique and individual um, and keep us all a little bit different from each other. And so it's hard for us to know specifically is this change something that is actually going to impact the function of the gene or not. Um, it's difficult when we think about kind of what brought us to genetic testing. You know, the Human Genome Project was a big project, but the majority of testing that's been done and the majority of our kind of reference genetic material and what we use to say, this is what we expect, this is kind of the norm, a lot of that's done in Caucasian males. And so if we've got somebody that's Hispanic or African American or Middle Eastern or anything else kind of outside of that, you know, small window of Caucasian male, it could just be that that's an ethnic variant where we're seeing this difference, but it's very common in that population, but maybe not in the reference DNA that we have. But it also is possible that it could be our answer for our disease. Um, so it's important to talk with your providers about those results and see exactly what their impression is. You know, I've seen a lot of these results that I'm like, I know the lab is calling this a VUS, but I feel really certain that we found our answer. Or I've had results that I'm like, I don't know that this really fits. I don't think this is a great explanation. There's not a lot of evidence that this is a harmful difference. So we really need to be careful with how we counsel this patient. And these results are all along a spectrum. So there's not clear cut breaks between these two. It's all kind of a range. 
Um, I want to talk a little bit about how we get to these results. Um, this is from a lab called GeneDx. They have a lot of testing options for neuromuscular disease in our lab that we use pretty regularly. And they have a very extensive process, as most labs do, for how we go from getting that sequencing you know, code and looking to see what's different than what we expected and getting to an actual report. Um, so you can see here kind of all along the way they're doing you know, literature searches and database reviews. There's lots of different things that go into prediction models for how we think this is gonna impact the specific protein. Looking at the patient's history and the clinical information, does this fit with the diagnosis with this gene. Um, going through a review process, kind of checking out the guidelines of how do we classify these variants. Um, so the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics put together a kind of classification guide to say this amount of evidence can push you towards pathogenic versus this amount of evidence pushes you towards benign. And so they go through and review what they have and often have a scoring system or other things like that that they'll go through to try to decide, do we think this is harmful or not? And then finally, actually getting to the report, putting everything together, um, reviewing that, and making sure that that's all written up appropriately. They've referenced all of this information that they've pulled. Um, this is why your reports can tend to be several pages long because there's a lot of data there that they're including. And then they always are going to be looking into further analysis, especially for those variants of uncertain significance. Is there someone else in the family that we could test and see if they also carry this genetic variant? Because if they both present with the same features and they both carry it, that's certainly reassuring. Is there someone in the family that does not have features that's available that we could test and looking to see if they carry it? Because if they do, maybe it's not our answer, but if they don't, maybe it is. And they're constantly analyzing the patients that are in their database and in their records to see, has anything changed? Do we need to provide updated information to this provider? Um, We've touched on a lot of this, but I just wanted to kind of highlight it in a little bit more detail. Um, variants of unknown significance are not confirming your diagnosis or denying your diagnosis. Um, so just be cautious with how you pursue those and how you interpret those and understand them and be sure to talk with your providers about that. Um, like I mentioned, the labs are continuing to review those, and it certainly is possible that they may reclassify that abnormality in the future and either say, yes, this is our answer, or no, this is not our answer, so be mindful of that as well. So a little bit into the types of genetic tests. So I mentioned earlier that knowing what your possible diagnosis is is important when it comes to picking a genetic test. There are thousands of genes that we could be looking at, um, even just within neuromuscular disease alone. So it's important to understand what we're looking at and how we're looking at that. Um, so chromosome analysis, that's just getting that big picture. So we can see large changes in the amount of genetic material, but not those small changes and certainly not those individual changes in the actual code itself. A chromosomal microarray is a way to look at the chromosomes, but on a much finer detail, looking for small missing or extra pieces of genetic material. Sometimes you'll see those referred to as an array comparative genomic hybridization, and that just means that they're comparing the amount of material to that reference. Sanger sequencing is a common way to get the individual letters that are in one single gene. It's not good when we want to look at multiple genes. So if we're looking at a gene um, in a condition where only one gene is associated with that diagnosis, it can be really helpful to do that. Um, but if we've got a condition where we've got multiple genes, like Charcot-Marie tooth, there's you know, 60 different genes we could be looking at. Sanger sequencing may not be the best way to do that, but certainly could be used to confirm a diagnosis found on other testing methodologies. Um, MLPA and PCR, these are ways that we can look for um, those kind of smaller missing or extra pieces 
um, similar to the chromosomal microarray, but on a little bit finer detail. So if we're looking for single exons missing or extra, this can be a good technology for that. Um, PCR is also a really good way to look um, as kind of a rough draft of those repeat expansions um, to see is it repeated beyond what we would say is consistent with a diagnosis or in the normal range. Um, and then next generation sequencing. I know it kind of sounds like something out of Star Trek, um, but this is our kind of latest and greatest way to look at lots of genes at one time. So these are platforms where we can look at hundreds of genes at the same time looking for those sequencing changes. And if we find something kind of reverting back to that Sanger sequencing to look for those individual changes within a single gene. Um, and then repeat expansion analysis, like I mentioned, having PCR, um, that usually also includes um, something called a southern blot, where we can get a better estimate of the exact size range for that repeat expansion. And in neuromuscular disease, we see every single one of these types of genetic tests. Um, there's also the option to look at all of a person's genetic information in one single test. Um, and that's something called exome or whole genome sequencing, where we're actually looking at all of the material there for any changes in those genes. Um, we typically do not do active analysis of every gene, but rather look um, with different kind of models to try to limit what we're looking at on those variants to see what's associated with the features in this particular patient. And so oftentimes, if you get a good targeted next-gen panel, that can be just as effective as an exome sequencing. Now, if you have a very generalized presentation or it's not specific to one type of disorder, that exome sequencing may be a good option for you to move forward on kind of a broader basis. So I'm gonna show you what some of these look like. So this would be what the chromosomes in a chromosome analysis look like under the microscope. So you can see they're not quite as pretty and lined up as that picture we looked at earlier. And then this is a microarray. So this is showing you what that amount of material is. Our kind of central line there is what the reference would be and where we expect it. And you can see at the top there, it's shifted a little bit um, to the left. So we have a either missing or extra piece. This doesn't show you um, which side is the gain or loss. In most platforms, that would be a loss of material. So those three genes that are listed there would be in that region and would be missing. And so it would give someone a diagnosis of that condition. And then these are those different sequencing technologies that we talked about um, that Sanger sequencing, looking at those single genes where we're only looking for that one sentence in the book versus those panels where we're looking for everything. Um, exome sequencing only looks at the coding material, so that material that goes on to make proteins. It's actually only about 1% to 2% of our overall genetic information, but is where the vast majority of harmful differences that cause disease would be. And then whole genome sequencing, looking again at everything in that book. So this just kind of walks you through each of those individual ones and you can see some of the references there. So why do we want to pursue genetic testing? How is that gonna be helpful for someone with a neuromuscular disease? Um, we've touched on some of these before, um, but this is a quote from the MDA directly that I think really kind of hits home with everything we're looking at. So genetic testing is important because a definitive diagnosis is the first step. So definitive diagnosis. So I really like the way they phrase that, where we're saying without a doubt, we know what your child has or what you have is the first step. So we must know what the diagnosis is before we do anything else. So the first step in effectively managing an individual's neuromuscular disease. We can propose treatments, we can propose you know, medications all day long, but if we don't have that specific diagnosis, we're not gonna be effective in our treatment. If you're giving someone steroids and they have a condition that doesn't respond to steroids, it's not gonna be a helpful treatment. If you're giving them an exon skipping drug and they have a totally different genetic variant, 
that's not going to help them at all. It's not going to change the function of the gene. It's not going to change how their body is managing that. It can ensure the most appropriate treatment strategy, best outcomes, and access to clinical trials or disease-specific patient registries. Sometimes just knowing who else is in your group of people and your community is really helpful. You know, neuromuscular disease is a broad category and children that have certain diagnoses are going to have different challenges. Adults are going to have different challenges. So knowing who else you can talk to and who else you can um, learn from and work together with is really going to be helpful and important. You know, the parent of a child with DMD is going to have a lot different challenges than the parent of a child with SMA. So knowing where you fall is going to be really important. And then I want to touch on um, a little bit of the testing that's out there. Um, so this is from the Duchenne Parent Project um, and shows kind of why they think testing is important. And a lot of this is things that we've already touched on, you know, confirming your diagnosis, getting the appropriate care, getting the appropriate management. Um, but it can also help to inform other family members. You know, we oftentimes hear, you know, my sister is considering having a child and she knows about my daughter's diagnosis and she's wondering what her chance to have a child with that is. Well, if we don't know what your daughter has, we can't help your sister with knowing what her chance is. You know, if you are starting to show symptoms of muscle disease and you're trying to figure out what that is and somebody else in the family has already gone through testing and gotten a diagnosis, it can be really helpful to get in touch with that person and have a copy of their test results so that we can do targeted testing and see, do you have the same thing? Or is it possible that there's two different neuromuscular diseases within this family? Um, so knowing that can be really important. Because a lot of the conditions we see do have childhood onset conditions, knowing about your risk for future children. Um, you know, we ha oftentimes hear people say, you know, if I knew that this was a sporadic thing and there was a low chance to have another child with it, I would certainly have a different opinion about expanding my family. Or if I knew I was at a 50% risk versus a 25% risk, that really changes how we would manage a pregnancy and what types of things we would do to prepare to have another child with a muscle disease or to decide that maybe our family is complete and we do not want to pursue having more children. So these can be really informative to know about that. There's lots of different testing options out there and there's actually lots of sponsored testing. And so I would encourage you before pursuing genetic testing to talk with your provider about some of these options and see if you would be eligible to try to get free testing through these different testing companies. So I'm gonna hit on a couple of the high points with those, but know that this is not an exhaustive list of what free testing options are out there. It's very diagnosis specific. Um, so the first one is through Perkin Elmer and Sanofi Genzyme. Um, so they offer a test. This is um, primarily looking at things like limb girdle muscular dystrophies um, and conditions like Fabray or Pompeii disease. Um, so this is kind of a more rare subset of diagnoses, but this is through the Lantern Project. Um, so Perkin Elmer is the lab that actually performs the testing. Sanofi Genzyme is who is managing um, and providing that testing free of charge. Um, SMA has a free testing program through a lab called Invite. Um, so if you have either a family history of the condition, a partner who's a carrier or a suspicion of a clinical diagnosis, they offer free testing through their sponsored program. This is something that can be done either with their typical platform where it takes about a week or so to get results back or they also have a stat panel where we can get results back in about 24 to 48 hours. Um, especially for our um, more severe types of SMA and our neonatal onsets, if we're wanting to do some of that therapy that's available, like gene therapy, that's um, really helpful to get this diagnosis quickly and early so that we can see um, their total copy number for SMN1 as well as for SMN2, because that's going to 
help determine which treatment options may be uh, most effective for you. And we do need to have that confirmation of the molecular result before pursuing um, any of the therapies, whether it be gene therapy or some of the new oral medications that have come out recently. Um, so that's a great option for patients um, and a company that does lots of genetic testing. Um, there's a couple of different ways to get testing for Duchenne that's free of charge. Um, so Decode Duchenne is a project that was started and then there's also Detect Muscular Dystrophy. Um, so Decode Duchenne um, is through the parent project um, and is sponsored by Sarepta, um, one of the drug therapy companies. Um, but then also Discover Duchenne and Discover Muscular Dystrophy is through Invite, um, and I believe is sponsored by another drug therapy company. But the list goes on and on of what tests are available. So these, again, not an exhaustive list, um, but you can see in this very tiny print, um, the comprehensive neuromuscular panel uh, is currently 123 genes. And I would say that that's not even kind of tipping the iceberg of everything that could be included. Um, so you can certainly see the list is quite long um, and you can be very specific to certain diagnoses or much more of a broad approach. Um, these are some of my references um, listed out here. Certainly if you have any disease specific questions, happy to try to answer those um, and do as best we can to get through those. So I will um, open it up for questions now. Hi, Dana. I'm so sorry about that. I was, had some technical difficulties with my laptop. Oh, you're fine. Um, so I did get a question that came through mm -hmm. um, with a later onset of a limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Would it be beneficial to get my children tested? Uh -huh. That's a really great question. Um, so this brings up a topic that we didn't really talk about today, and that's kind of timing of testing. Mm -hmm. um, when we're dealing with neuromuscular disease, because we are looking at such a broad range of onset as far as age of onset, we want to make sure that we're being cautious with that. Um, there are some conditions that you will not find anyone that will test a child for because they are purely adult onset. Many of those have neurological impact, not neuromuscular. So thinking about things okay. like autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease, Huntington's disease, these are conditions that we really want to make sure that the person undergoing testing understands and accepts what those results will mean for them and their health. When we're thinking about a neuromuscular disease, it's good to think about what that average age of onset is and what those interventions could be. If we've got something that can start happening in the 20s or 30s or be variable within families, certainly testing a child or a teenager can be helpful. However, if we've got a condition like Huntington's, it's not going to be onset until much later, it has a lot of you know, psychosocial things to consider, maybe holding off on testing them. Um, I think it really depends on your diagnosis specifically um, and what, you know, the implications of that diagnosis would be. Certainly, I would test a child for a limb girdle muscular dystrophy, whether your presentation is late onset or more of a typical earlier onset. Um, there's a follow-up to the question of, would you have to go to clinic? And the answer is yes. We do not do genetic testing for people who are not our patients. Um, it gets a little bit tricky when you're talking about those variant resolution tests because that is often done as part of the patient's testing. So we can send out a testing kit and get that testing facilitated, um, but that is all part of the patient's. We prefer to see those individuals in clinic because we want to do a good physical exam, a good neuro exam. Are there any signs or symptoms there? Are there other features of the condition outside of muscle disease that we want to look at? and be able to kind of get that evaluated um, to make sure we're doing our best as far as informed testing. Okay. And this person typed in that they have two different genes from two labs. Would this be something to look into more extensively? 
It really depends on what those genes are um, and how they fit with your specific presentation and your specific diagnosis. Um, so with those variants of uncertain significance, certainly they can have implication with your diagnosis, but they may not be. Sometimes they can be a red herring that's a little bit distracting when we're trying to get a diagnosis. It's definitely possible that, you know, the reason you're having two different results is because we're looking at two different sets of genes on those, but also those labs all have their own classification, and so they're going to look at those a little bit differently, they may not give a result the same classification. I've done follow-up family member testing at a different lab and gotten a different classification of the same abnormality. And so that can be another challenge that we see. Um, if, if someone were to have gotten an inconclusive test, let's say eight, 10 years ago, um, would you recommend that they get genetic, genetically tested again? Um, I would actually start with genetic counseling. Okay. We want to look at that test and see, has anything changed from that test itself? Is it a condition like Duchenne where the testing and our detection rate has not changed a lot in the last 10 years? Or is it something like CMT where 10 years ago we might have had three genes that we were looking at and now we have 60? It's a much different test. And so repeating testing can be really helpful, but is not something that I would just recommend globally for anybody that's testing was done that long ago. I think it's very disease specific. Okay. Um, and the question of who would I see, that mm -hmm. is a challenging question. Um, so it depends on your specific presentation and if you're a child or an adult. Um, so our children, we prefer for them to be seen in our multidisciplinary clinic so that we can get everybody's perspective and genetics is actively there in that clinic. And so we're working directly with the neurologist to see what are the features of this individual and what testing can we do. For an adult, the testing can be done with their neurologist. The multidisciplinary clinic there is not quite as extensive. Genetics is available as an on-call basis, mm -hmm. and so we often help coordinate the testing for them, but again, they're doing that evaluation to try to see what group of genes are we looking for the most. Um, and it looks like there was a follow-up with the two variants of unknown significance mm -hmm. being in the same gene. That would depend on the inheritance pattern. If we're looking at two variants within a recessive gene, those may be on opposite copies. And so we wanna do further testing to see if they are on opposite copies, or are they in the same copy? And same for if it's a dominant disorder. You know, if we've got those and they're each on a different copy, one of those is probably not harmful because those conditions tend to be lethal when we're seeing two harmful copies on each side. So a good example of that is when we think about, and I know this is not neuromuscular disease, but achondroplasia, so a common inherited form of dwarfism, that's a dominant condition. So we see only one of those two copies of the gene having that abnormality. When we have two individuals with achondroplasia that have a child together and that child inherits both of those, it's a much more severe presentation of the condition that can even be lethal. And so we're seeing kind of even more extensive disease than what we would see in those individuals with just one harmful difference. So okay. some of it would be talking with your counselor or your neurologist and seeing, does it really make sense for you? Mm -hmm. Is it possible for a child to have a different subtype than a parent? Some conditions, yes. Okay. Um, many conditions, even in, especially in the neuromuscular realm, have phenotypic expression variability where we're seeing a variety of features within the family. So no two individuals with the family look exactly identical with their disease. So some may have more problems with their arms, whereas others okay. may have more problems with their legs mm -hmm. or be wheelchair bound much sooner than other members of the family. It all can kind of vary. And there's other genetic factors there. What those are, we just don't always know. Okay. Okay. And to find a genetic counselor in their area, what is the best um, thing for our audience to do to reach yeah. out? The best way to find a genetic counselor is to go to the National Society of Genetic Counselors website. That's nsgc.org. And there is a button on there that says find a genetic counselor. And all you have to do is enter your zip code um, and you can enter kind of the distance you're willing to travel and they will help you find a genetic counselor. Um, the MDA also has our contact information so they can get you in touch with our care center and get you an appointment in our care center if that's something that you're interested in um, for both the pediatric or adult side. 
and you and just to make sure you said nsgc.org mm -hmm. okay. national I, society genetic counselors all right i type that into our chat feature so you guys can access that there all right dan i don't see anything else thank you so much for your time this saturday thank you guys so much i'll have a great weekend you too